views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Saturday, November 6, 2021. Today's episode is about elderly onset of SLE. That's right, I said elderly onset of SLE. Elderly onset lupus um, is defined in various studies as onset of lupus after age 50 through 65 years. We'll be discussing that along with wide differences in thinking skills and abilities linked to cognitive dysfunction in lupus. Also, you'll hear the latest um, in regards to my health update. Also, a tribute to my mother. That's right, a tribute to my mother. So, you know what I want you to do all the way from the United States to Kenya. Get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to those who are listening late at night, you guys know I appreciate you. So go ahead, get ready. Grab your favorite glass of wine and come on and join the conversation right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. Did you realize or assume that... Individuals could um, have elderly onset of systemic lupus erythematosus. Well, they can, and it's research to prove that. This information is retrieved from the National Library of Medicine. National Center for Biotechnical Information PubMed.gov. We know that lupus erythematosus is an autoimmune multi system disease of uncertain etiology with highly variable clinical manifestations. Women of childbearing age are most often affected. However, approximately 10 to 20% of cases occur in older patients. Elderly onset lupus. Elderly onset lupus has been defined in various studies as onset of lupus after age 50 to 65 years old. Menopause and changes in cellular immunity 
with aging may contribute to development of lupus in older adults. Many studies suggest that the clinical features of elderly onset lupus differ from those of lupus in younger patients, arthritis, fever, sicka symptoms, Raynaud syndrome, lung disease, and neuropsychiatric symptoms are more common in patients with elderly onset lupus, while malar rash, discoid lupus, are less common in elderly onset patients compared with younger lupus patients. Now, most elderly onset lupus patients have a positive anti-nuclear antibody test, but the prevalence of the anti-double-stranded DNA is lower in elderly onset patients than in younger patients. Rheumatoid factor, anti-RO, Sjogren syndrome, A and anti-LASSB are more often positive in elderly onset patients. The diagnosis of elderly onset lupus may be delayed for many months. Insidious onset, low pre prevalence, and similarity to other more common disorders make the diagnosis of lupus challenging in this population. Treatment of lupus in the elderly may be more complicated by comorbidities and increased risk of toxicities from usual treatments. Optimal management of elderly onset lupus is imperative because of a lack of randomized control studies. However, the approach to treatment is similar regardless of the age of the patient. Now we're going to talk about wide differences in thinking skills and abilities linked to cognitive dysfunction in lupus. Now, new research indicates that beyond cognitive thinking, test scores themselves, the degree of variability between test scores can help signal cognitive dysfunction in lupus. Cognitive issues are common in people with lupus from brain fog and memory problems to difficulty concentrating and making decisions. To test for CD, clinicians typically provide a broad set of different exams to assess different types of cognitive skills. These latest findings show that not only can the individual test scores help identify CD in those with lupus, but that simply having widely different scores from one test to the next is also strongly and significantly associated with CD. This insight may offer a new practical way to interpret the results, thus improving 
the screening for CD and people with lupus. This study was the result of a 2020 Gina M. Fincy Memorial Student Fellowship Project led by Jennifer He, funded by the Lupus Foundation of America. Thank you for joining me back. I want to tell you a story. I was in um, my eye doctor's office had last month, and a young lady was in the room next to mine, and they were discussing um, her condition, and she said to the um, eye doctor, you know I have Sjogren's. He said, do you have a rheumatologist that you see? And she said, no. She said, all I need for you to do is to fill the prescription for my eye medication. And he said, no, what I need for you to do is to find a rheumatologist, make an appointment, and go see them because do you understand that you are at a higher risk of certain types of cancer? And she, there was no response. And he said, I'm suspecting that you also have lupus. And she said, well, I have to take the time to find a rheumatologist to go to. He said, I want you to do that. And he told her that I will fill your eye prescription this time. But when you come back, I need for you to have seen a rheumatologist regarding your condition so you can go through the testing. And she said, okay. But did you know that SLE and other autoimmune diseases are linked to an increased risk of certain types of cancer? This is not to scare you, but to provide knowledge and inform you that don't take this illness lightly. Lupus patients may experience an elevated risk of lymphoma and other cancers, such as cancer of the cervix. Now, I have did a podcast on this before. For example, it is widely accepted that immunosuppressive medications such as Imron or Celsep contribute to elevated cancer risk. However, one of the largest studies to investigate this connection suggests that the risk of cancer is actually greatest during the early stages of lupus, indicating that exposure to immunosuppressive therapy is not the only link between lupus and cancer. Now, studies show increased risk of both Hodgkin's and non Hodgkin's lymphoma in lupus patients. It is believed that elevated risk of lymphoma results from the disease process of lupus. The overstimulation of B cells coupled 
with defects in the immune system surveillance system. And not just from medications or other associated risk factors. Some suggest that immunosuppressive medications also increase the risk of lymphoma and other blood cancers, especially five or more years after taking the drugs. In addition, people with Sjogren's syndrome, which is relatively common in lupus, experience even a greater elevation of lymphoma risk, suggesting lymphoma in lupus patients also may be linked to this condition. And that brings me to this. I was in my rheumatologist's office in October. He came in with this look on his face. He said, Susan, I said, what diagnosis are you planning to add now? He said, we have to see what's going on. Because your lab work was off the grid. And he stated what I mean by that. And I interrupted him and said, all of my lab work was either high or low. He said, yes. He said, the problems that you've been having with your stomach, the problem with the infections in your lymph nodes are not a good sign. And so I asked him, I said, so you want to see if I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? And he said, yes. We need to draw blood. He said, stated, um, when you go back to your eye doctor, I need um, your latest field study so we can see how the back of your eyes are doing because you will eventually have to go on some type of therapy if it's what we suspect it is. And all the while, while I'm sitting there, I'm rebuking everything he was saying. And he went on and he said, let me examine you. And he looked at the swelling in my neck and he said, I want to examine this. And he touched it and I said, that that hurts. And he further examined my neck and he said, it hurts under there also. I said, yes. He said, do you have any swelling under your armpits or growing? I said, no. And he asked me, he said, are you having excessive sweating at night when you're trying to sleep? I said, yeah. And so he started calling things off. And I said, yeah, I've had that. Yeah, this, and yeah, that. And steady in my mind, I'm rebuking everything that he was saying to me. But I told him if it is non Hodgkins, we deal with it. Well, got some lab work back, and there's no changes in the lab work. 
And so he told me, he said, eventually we may have to do a biopsy. And I said, mm-hmm. I said, and the biopsy is for um, to examine to see if it is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So when I go back to him on this upcoming um, Thursday, November the 11th, we will discuss the biopsy. We will discuss what type of treatment. We will discuss the lab work. We will discuss... Um, what to look for next. He asked me how I was feeling. I said, I don't feel my best. Um, I don't feel good. I don't feel bad, but I keep going. I said, "Um, the um, specialist who did the biopsy before, Um, I was getting ready to say his name and I caught myself. I said, he informed me that I was not out of the woods. And um, to come back to him, if I started um, to having the same um, difficulties that I was having before um, they went in and did the biopsy. And um, those symptoms have just now started to reoccur. I say all of that to say this. This illness is no joke. This illness needs more awareness brought forth within the communities that we live in. You know, um, lupus has been around for a long time. Um, There has been some clinical strides in the field of research for this illness. But my question is, is this, And research has proven that um, lupus is linked to a gene that could be genetic. And if the case, if this is the case, why can't you go in and remove that particular gene? Um, Also, why is it? taking so long for a cure for this illness. Now, I'm really teed off, you know, and um, it's like You go to some doctors and they don't know what to do for you. And all of my doctors have told me, Susan, you know the real deal of this illness. You know we only um, can treat you to make you feel comfortable, to give you some type of quality of life. But when you when they say quality of life, to me that's broad cuz it represents different things to different individuals. So I tell my story because I'm the only one that knows what I go through dealing with this illness 
since the age of five. And you've heard me talk about the signs on this podcast, about the signs um, started to occur when I was five years old. It is time to bring further awareness to this illness within communities of color. It's time to educate those who take it lightly, just like the story I was telling you about the young lady um, in the eye doctor's office who was taking Sjogren's likely. And the doctor told her, I suspect that you have lupus also. People, don't take this illness lightly. I do what I'm doing to help someone down the road who is confused, who does not know what to ask, or if they are confused or when they go into the doctor's office, don't be scared to say, wait a minute. Speak plain English to me. And doctors have to realize that you need to educate the patients more. Don't just sit up there and write a script and say, here, take this. I'll see you back in three months. It doesn't work like that. You have patients that are scared, confused about this illness. And if you don't tell them the medical aspects of this illness, You leave it up to those of us who fight every day with this illness to try to make it known how this illness reacts on our bodies. And we know that lupus is not a one-size-fits-all illness. It reacts with each individual differently. We say we want a cure, but what we really need to do, we need to do better and bring lupus awareness forth within the communities in which we live. Well, my friends, I thank you for joining me um, on this Saturday, November 6th. I want to leave you with this tribute to my mother. On this day, we watched our mother make her transition. I bent down and whispered into her ear, Mama, go ahead. Daddy is waiting for you. It's okay. Go on. My sister Wanda removed the catheter. I began to give her a bed bath, rubbing her down in lotion, placing white PJs, white slippers on her. And yes, I made sure her hair was combed and pulled back into a bun. And while I was doing this, I was saying to myself, this will be the last time I will be able to touch, smell you, and comb your hair. As I watched the funeral home place my 
mother's body into the car that night. And as the car began to pull off, I started walking beside it, not wanting her to go. I stood on the corner of California Street and John R watching until I could no longer see the car any longer. Oh, the talks we would have, the wisdom you gave me is priceless. I will always love my baby doll, my prayer warrior, my doctor, my coffin doll my mama I love you Miss Hendrix I'm Susan Hendrix your host for my story living with lupus y'all say a prayer for me I'll see you next week for another episode